Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited to have you with us because today is Friday and today is Ask and Answer. This is a special day that we have at the end of every week where our viewers and listeners can write in, text in, call in, stop us on the street and ask questions and then we get somebody from Fundraising Academy to join us in these discussions. It's really funny, Tony. Sometimes the questions are the same. Sometimes quite the similar questions come up every few months and then sometimes the questions are completely out of the blue and we're like, what? <laughs> so it's kind of a, for me, it's a fun thing. Today, it is fun. It really is. Today we have Tony Bell, Senior Director from National University Academies and the Relationship Center. He is really the very first person that we on the nonprofit show engaged mm. with and then we just like created this amazing partnership. And so we don't always get to have Tony back um, in the hot seat with us and we sure are excited when he is here. Tony has been in the nonprofit sector pretty much his whole life. Even as a teenager, I know you were doing fundraising and doing things. <laughs> you it's know, it's true. true. No, it's true, right? When you think about kind of your pathway to where you are in the nonprofit sector. Uh, yes, I think many of us, a very young age where we're philanthropic and raising money and and all of that good stuff and, and built some of those core skills very early on. I think so. And I think it's a fascinating thing to see that trajectory that nobody could identify or really understand or talk about. But when you step back and you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> that's what we always did. So. And what is happening in, with us and, and where we have really come ahead is our relationships with our presenting sponsors and those include bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit thought leader fundraising academy at national university staffing boutique nonprofit nerd and nonprofit tech talk these are the fo folks that join with us day in and day out and uh, really they make a difference and they allow us now to be at about 850 episodes so um it's a it's a lot um that's great yeah, thank you. Hey, you can get to the nonprofit show three ways. You can scan the code and get the new app that um, our amazing team at American Nonprofit Academy, led by Kevin Pace, crafted for us. It's remarkable. You can also find us on podcast formats and then, of course, streaming broadcasts. So however you like to consume your content, get educated, get inspired, we're with you. So join us. Okay, Tony, you ready? Yes, yes, absolutely. Let's see what the viewers have sent us for this week. Okay, this is like the best because this person signed it frustrated in Fresno. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know if that was you just protecting someone no. and we're getting creative. So instead of saying anonymous, you said frustrated in Fresno. I thought it was fantastic. No, they wrote frustrated in Fresno. I just thought that was a hoot. Okay, but it's a good, it's an important question. And I bet there are a lot of people that have the same issue. And frustrated in Fresno writes, how can I get fellow team members in development to be putting better information in our database system? I am frustrated that our donor database does not have good information entered and it's frankly wasting my time. Man, garbage in, garbage out. Rule oh, number. for sure, right? And time is money, so. And, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, what, do you, what do you suggest? Because I don't really have good answer. a good answer for this. Yeah, so, you know, so this is all around kind of standards of practice, right? Business norms within the organization. And how do you get folks to kind of lean in into those? Uh, so a couple of things that I, I would recommend. One is let's get everybody together. And let's talk about the importance of the database system. I mean, one, frustrated in Fresno, thank goodness you have a database system to be frustrated with because there are many organizations that don't have the capacity, financial or otherwise, to even have a database. So, so first, you know, let's bring everybody together. Let's talk about why we need a database because maybe you're going to find out in the room that people are going to say, we don't need a database, and that's why we're not using it. So let's have a conversation around the why of a database. I love then that. Let's, then let's have a conversation around the database we're using. Maybe it's not user friendly. I mean, maybe there were things around the tool that's been selected or subscribed to that doesn't really support either the culture of the organization, the way that your fundraising team is working. So mm -hmm. then let's talk about the tool. 
then maybe, you know, so now, you know, everyone has buy-in around the, the value and the why, and we've talked about the tool, it's the right tool. Um, then I think you need to consider whether or not you you need to implement some incentives. Okay. You oh. know, for, for folks. And, and when I say it's, it doesn't mean anything crazy, but just kind of like they were the star database user for the week or mm -hmm. for the month or, you know, so just think mm -hmm. about ways to incentivize folks for using the system and using it the way that they, they should use it. Uh, okay. Yeah. So those are, those are just some of the things. And then, you know, frustrated in Fresno, when you're having your team meetings, bringing those scenarios to the team meetings and saying, this was, the challenge that I had, or mm -hmm. this is how I feel like my time was wasted when I went to go, you know, use the database because X, Y, and Z wasn't there. Like I wanted to send this donor a birthday card and we didn't even have the birthday in, you know, in, in the system. So really giving those real life examples of how the information that isn't being provided is negatively impacting your success uh, might yeah. also help folks. So those are some of the things that that I would recommend. I had the real pleasure of working with an international organization years and years ago that were struggling with this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really important because they were dealing with a lot of high end celebrity you know, donors. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really important that that kind of information, you know, stay within the organization and be there for someone else to be able to pick it up and, and carry it on. But for whatever reason, they couldn't. They were in the position where they were able to build a a dashboard. So a lot of stuff that they were using were, were custom and internal for the organization, mm -hmm. like the, the donor management system was something they built internally. Mm -hmm. uh, so they ended up investing in in building a much simpler kind of dashboard that communicated with the donor management system. But the dashboard was much more user friendly, a lot easier to enter information. And then that fed the data to you know the main donor management system. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of organizations are going to be in the position to create another custom technology dashboard to support the other donor management system. Sure. But that's just one example of the extent that some organizations go through to make sure that they're capturing this really important information about their donors. You know, Tony, you said something kind of interesting, and I'm wondering if I had never thought of this, and that is, is that maybe your team members don't really understand why it's important and how it's being used. And they just think it's like another stupid task that they have to do that doesn't have any value or meaning. And so mm -hmm. I, I like your approach to say, this is how it gets used. And when we can find statistics on every time you touch, you know, a donor, whether it be a, a card or a thank you, or it's not like necessarily for an ask. It's, it's also, I feel like it goes back to what we were talking uh, with the fundraising Academy team on the cause selling cycle about the importance of building a relationship. And it's mm -hmm. this information that will help us do that. So it's, oh, it's kind of, for sure. It's almost like a reeducation, if you will. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah, for sure. Fresno, I hope this helps. I really do. <laughs> I've been to Fresno. I can, I know it can be a little frustrating. So. <laughs> and thank you for the creativity on the signature, right? I mean, that was great. That was great. And I hope that, I hope that that's helpful. I mean, you know, it's folks, you know, when, when we think about building trust amongst our teams, one of the core pillars of being, tr of building trust is logic. So when you, if you want to build your team members trust in the process, they need to understand the logic behind it. I love that. That might just be the best message of the day, but we still have more questions. So let's see if you can come up with something that beats that because that was pretty damn good. Well, okay. thank you. <laughs> Judith from Los Angeles, California writes, what is the protocol for a major gifts officer to communicate to existing donors that they are leaving and moving to another nonprofit? We're going to be experiencing this change and I want to have a precise action plan so there are no surprises as this person transitions to another organization. I read between the lines and I hear Judith saying she's afraid that this major gifts officer is going to take donors. Is that well, what that's all, I think that that's always a, a, a fear, right? But, but 
you know, again, we're in a relationship business. And, and Julia, if you and I have a, a relationship and you're, um, you know, the major donor for the cause that I'm, I'm supporting and I move on to another organization, it doesn't mean you're going to be passionate about that cause. True. So it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're naturally just going to follow me and be like, come on, Julia, let's you and, and you know, <laughs> and, and your, your philanthropic desires, just follow me wherever I go. Right. Uh, in some cases, that does happen. We all know that that happens because certain philanthropists really trust certain development professionals and, and will follow them because they're going to trust the investment in their dollars, right? Uh, so here, there were a couple of different things that came to mind as, as you were reading this. One, Judith, yes, you do need to have a plan. And you do need to do whatever you can in all areas to, you know, we, we always talk in, in my organization about the no surprises rule, right? Over communicate so that there, there are just no surprises. Um, so the first thing I think about is what does the portfolio look like for this major gifts officer? Because you're, again, relationships, everyone's different. Your approach to communicating this change to this portfolio of of donors is going to be different depending on the donor. So I would look yes. at this, I would look at this major gift, you know, look at their portfolio. Right. Who, who is it appropriate to receive an email? Right. Who can, who can just receive an email? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can have the conversation. Should the email come from the CEO or executive director, or should it come from the, the major gifts officer that's leaving? Okay. I'm, I'm on the fence with that. I think it depends on, again, the dynamics of the organization, you know, kind of the culture. Some some CEOs are going to say, oh, no, that needs to come from me. Um, you know, in, in most cases, I would say if you're going to do an email, it needs to be a joint message with joint signatures, both from the CEO and from the major gift officer that's leaving, because you want that donor as the CEO or executive director, you want that donor to know that you're in tune with what's happening. You know what I mean? So that you're not just a, a statistic in, in their financials. Uh, so there's that. So again, think about the different tiers within the portfolio for this major gift officer. What are the most appropriate communication styles to retain those donors? In some cases, you're gonna wanna set up a face-to-face -face with the outgoing officer and you as the ED or CEO, because okay. I, because very rarely, unless you're promoting internally, mm -hmm. very rarely are you going to have this officer's replacement for them to be able to do those kinds of introductions. Right. Again, unless it's an internal candidate, and then you might have the opportunity as the outgoing officer to take the internal candidate to some meetings and introduce them. This is the person that'll be, you know, managing the relationship moving forward, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so yes, definitely support a plan. You don't want to surprise donors by them calling one day and finding out, oh, the person's no longer there. Oh, yeah. um, but again, in, in the spirit of kind of cost selling and one-on-one -on -one relationships, think about the varying ways in which you're going to need to communicate this message to these, these major donors. You know, Tony, this almost seems like an interesting, and ser just as, as, as serendipity, that this would follow the question about keeping the donor database updated because a lot of this even though it's major gifts i mean it, it should that those stories should be in there right it should all be there yes so, <laughs> especially for someone that's a major gifts officer i mean that implies you know that we're talking about high level donors for your you know impactful gifts for your organization yeah all yeah especially for for you know, what I'm assuming, you know, the level of, of investor uh, yeah. for this particular officer. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's really interesting because when I first read this question and then I, I read it aloud, I, I could feel the fear in it, but I, I think right out the gate, your comment about, look, donor investors don't just follow the major gift officers. They might, and there's trust, but the reality is they might be moving to something that that doesn't capture the attention of that philanthropic donor. And so, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to devastate an organization, but you have to be smart and you have to have a plan. So yeah, Judith, I hope this helps you. Um, it helped me and I, I loved hearing about this. 
Okay, let's go to um, another part of the, I'm going to say world. <laughs> We're going to go to the other coast from Richard in Newark, New Jersey. Our board is thinking about finding an interim CEO for a retiring CEO. My question is this, how long does it take to find a qualified interim CEO? I keep hearing that full-time nonprofit CEOs are taking about 18 months to hire. Wow. So that's, I didn't realize that that's kind of the runway that was, that we're looking at now for, for full-time CEOs. Uh, well, I'm hearing that too. I'm hearing yeah. that too. Yeah. So, uh, so, so Richard, the, the first thing I would say is, boy, I wish the nonprofit nerd was on this particular <laughs> ask and answer because Jared is such a fan of, of the interim uh, roles within nonprofit organizations. And there's a lot of value, a lot of hidden value that folks don't think about when you consider an interim role, whether it be a CEO or development officer, are the are what that fresh set of eyes is going to see mm -hmm. um, and, and be able to share with you as just kind of like, oh, you know, I kind of recognize this. I don't know if you've seen this happening, but your incoming CEO, you might want to make them aware of, of this happening, right? And then also, as the uh, if when you hire an interim CEO or again any interim role, when you do finally after eighteen months, hopefully sooner, mm -hmm. uh, secure that full time CEO, you now have an interim that can really help onboard them. Mm -hmm. So you know, so think about your interim CEO in terms of the time frame of the investment not just when, you know, the start date of your new CEO, but maybe a month or even two months after to right. really give that CEO good onboarding support. Uh, so definitely support the idea of an interim CEO. Uh, how long does it take to find a qualified interim CEO? That I, I'm not gonna make up a number. I'm not really sure what that runway looks like for an interim CEO. Uh, I, I would venture to say that most interim CEOs are consultants. Uh, so once you you know find the right consultant, it's probably pretty turnkey from there, right? It's negotiating the contract, and uh, so. Yeah, I don't think it's as is hard. I mean, I also think there's there are communities where there are more interim CEOs, right? Because like, you can just see where like trainings are and 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 organizations once. An organization has used it and used it successfully in a community that spreads like wildfire mm -hmm. and the board members and you know the the ecosystem of nonprofit management is hip to it and goes yeah this is some this is a tool we're going to use For because sure. right you're right tony it's not a babysitting uh mechanism it's somebody that goes in and almost does forensic work they review all the the pieces of the organization and kind of uh, do that deep dive into all the different um, aspects of community service mm -hmm. and structure so that not only can you hire the right, you know, the next CEO, <laughs> but then you can bring somebody in successfully and to your point, onboard them. And so, but yeah, I keep hearing it's a good 12 to 18 months to find mm -hmm. somebody. And this is not surprising given where we are post pandemic. We, we had an issue moving into the pandemic about a huge swath of nonprofit CEOs and founders that were retiring, many who held on and stayed on during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And then as you know, the all clear is kind of going on right now, the time we're living in, people are like, okay, I'm out. I stayed an extra three years. <laughs> I'm tired. Or, right, know? I'm done. I'm, I'm I, so done. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> It's interesting, but yeah, you got to jump on this because and, that. And, yeah, and, and Richard doesn't ask specifically in, in this question, uh, and I'm sure this is being considered, but, you know, being very clear around what this interim CEO is empowered to do and the level of decision making. And, you know, so you, you to your point, Julia, it's, it's, it's more than babysitting, right? You, you, it, it's more than just keeping things afloat because you still want to keep things moving forward. Nice. Um, but it can be tricky for an interim CEO if the level of empowerment isn't really clearly defined. Right. No, it has to be very specific. And um, you have to have a board that can 
um, understand that. And, and, and also, I think you have to have a board that steps up and says, okay, you know, we were meeting once a quarter. Okay, no, we're going to meet, you know, or at least every month or the executive committee, or you're going to have to have something that's a, a little bit more engaging at that level. So yeah, I hope that helps. It's a really, it's, it's an interesting thing. Good for you for trying to con have this concept moving forward. It's not going to be easy, but it's smart. It Jackie, is smart. Yeah. Jackie from Memphis, Tennessee writes in, do you have any guidance on what the average nonprofit board member should be paying for their annual give or get? We are updating our board requirements and currently get our give or get is only $100. This seems quite low. Well, every board member should be giving <laughs> should be giving at least a million dollars to their organization. Whoop. Okay, show if done. Only, right? We solved all the problems. We solved all the problems, right? Everyone's going to give a million dollars. Um, well, well, Jackie, thank you for the question. And what's really interesting is just this whole concept around give or get, there's a, a resurgence in the conversation around give and get. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And and the, the implications that that has to certain boards and certain nonprofits, especially, you know, more grassroots community based organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think the, the first thing to focus on is creating that culture of philanthropy, that culture of giving within your board. So at least they're giving something. Yeah. yeah. And I think where, where a lot of this, and this is just Tony's brain, where a lot of this came from with the give or get was when funders started looking for matching gifts. And where funders specifically in the grant world were asking the question, what percentage of your board give? Mm -hmm. Or even more specifically, what, you know, how much collectively, <laughs> like they want a dollar figure, has your board contributed annually to the organization? Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, so there, there are those types, I think, of, of scenarios that got us to this point where organizations are having this conversation. One, should we have a give or get policy? Mm -hmm. And then to Jackie's point, what should that give or get look like? Mm -hmm. um, so there isn't a one size fits all answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I do agree though, Jackie, that your board members do need to be contributing something. Mm -hmm. uh, because at least when we're applying for that grant, we wanna be able to say that 100% of our board are making a financial contribution, even if it's $50, mm -hmm. you know, that there are $25 even that, that they're contributing. I think, I think also in this, um, as, as Jackie, as you're thinking about what that amount looks like, you have to think about, you know, equity amongst your board and inclusion amongst your board. I mean, you want diversity in your board, uh, not only in terms of, of gender and, and, ethnicity and all of that, but, but, you know, diversity really in, in financial status and diversity in the communities that they're living in. Right. So, uh, so you're going to, so, so you just have to be really mindful <laughs> of, of what that amount looks like and how that is going to impact all of your board members. Mm -hmm. um, and think about the other ways that they, that they contribute and is there, so when we talk about give or get, you know, when you, if you're going to raise it above a hundred dollars, really think about those board members that are going to be mostly impacted and think about the ways that they're already contributing in the give category and think about how you're going to soft credit them, you know, in the give and how you might be able to elevate that. I love that idea of, of soft credit. I've never heard it phrased that way. I like that. I'm also a big fan of having a scholarship for this so that if you do have somebody that could help you with that diversity and equity issue that then you can say yeah no problem we have a fund for that especially if let's say you're a younger board member right i mean are you you're not you're not earning at the level that your older board members are and you're in a different phase of your life there's no problem i think of saying we're going to scholarship that in for 3 years or 5 years or whatever um or, you know, rotating, something like that. I think that's smart. And, and maybe your give or get, I just, it's the first time I've ever thought, really kind of thought of this, but maybe your give or get is on a sliding scale dependent upon their years of service. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe your first year on the board, it's $100. Maybe your second year, it's 200. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's something creative that could be done and, and your give or get is based on your years of service to the board. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I think you have to be flexible. Uh, number one, you need to know that you are right, Tony. Donors and funders and contracts that, that nonprofits are engaging in are asking that question. What percentage of the board donates? And, and then the next level would be, what's yeah. that amount? So absolutely, you've got to look at that and have that be something that the board understands why this is happening, right? Sure. I mean, because it's a different. Um, I would I, also again, say, again, Julia, it's that why, right? It's the logic it's behind the it. The logic, yeah, yeah, that's the lesson of the day for me. <laughs> you know, I think the other thing too is don't uh, confuse board dues with the give or get, and that's for another uh, time. But yes. board dues can usually are used to pay for the operations of the board. So maybe uh, food or travel or you know, labor, whatever. Um, so that's a different piece versus mm -hmm. that other thing. Okay, we, we don't have much time, but I do want to squeeze in one more question. It goes that, by so fast. <laughs> I know it does, even for me. Um, this is a name withheld, and I'll tell you, I took this name off because I didn't, I didn't want it to be. Um, I just didn't want it to be disclosed. You didn't, comes, you didn't, you didn't name it Sassy in St. Louis or something. <laughs> Oh my God, I, I need to start doing that because that's actually, that would be fun for me. Um, yeah, name withheld. Our CEO thinks we should do an employee audit questionnaire to determine employee satisfaction. She is thinking we should have an outside company or person do this to keep it at an arm's length. Do you think this is critical or can we do it internally? It will cost a lot less if we do it. Of course, it's going to cost a lot less if, if you do it, you know, in, internally and 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 kudos for thinking that way. Right. That's good fiscal management. It's like, first, let's think about the resources internally and the talent internally. But I think for some type of employee audit or questionnaire uh, that it does need to be done by a third party or an external source. Uh, okay. I just I just I just think that folks are going to buy into the process. They're going to find the results more credible. Uh, if it's done externally. Okay. I think that's, yeah, a good thing. I just was talking to somebody about this, like, gosh, this week. And, and the person said, now that I'm thinking of it, we were at lunch and she's like, yeah, I was asked to take, um, a, you know, a questionnaire about my organization and it came to my email and then it was sent from my email. So even though it was anonymous, the info, you know, they could identify me. And she was like, and it, and it was really interesting. I was like, wow, yeah, okay. I mean, she's like, yeah, how anonymous was that? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I think you're right. I think it should be done um, externally. And I love, you know, the message of the day. Understand the logic and, and educate on that. And then it, you'll get better answers. It'll be more efficiently tabulated. And I think it also takes it from a he said, she said. It, it pulls it out into a third party delivery of that information, which mm -hmm. is ultimately the thing you need. And and then, I mean, I know the question doesn't really ask this, but be prepared to do something with the data. Yes. Be prepared. I agree with you. Don't ask if you can't work on it because that's just, that's so frustrating. You know, you, you yeah, be prepared to do something with the data. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tony Bell, Senior Director, National University Academy's Relationship Center, you are a gem, my friend. I you are learn, too. Oh my gosh, I learned so much from you. Um, and I always enjoy your spirit and your intelligence. And so, um, but you know, Tony's one of many people and I think they're all like this. So check out Fundraising Academy um, and you can access their, their site through fundraising-academy.org. And you can learn all about the different things that they're doing. Um, Pretty much most all of its free content, it is remarkable. If I'd had it in my community when I was starting out, I would have raised millions more. I can witness to you on that as a non-professional, non-paid uh, fundraiser, but a community partner, uh, definitely. I would have done better for my community. So in my next life, right, Tony? There we go. 
<laughs> hey, in my next life, I hope I'm still thanking our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Tony, this has been remarkable. You've given me a lot to think about today. I think a lot of great information. Information, Yeah, head explosion all over the place because I'm going to lead with logic saves the day and logic helps move the needle. It does. It's always so good to see you. Thank you again for inviting me and, and allowing me to be part of these conversations. It's remarkable. Hey, everybody. We like to end every episode with our message, and that is stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here on Monday, everyone. Thank you, Tony. 